In respect of your time and everyone else's, I'd like to get started. Before we do, I'd remind people this is being videotaped, so please turn off cell phones or any other electronic devices like that so that they are not interrupted. Those who come to testify, please make sure your microphone has a green light on or generally a button either on the pad or on the stem. And if we can't hear you, we'll let you know. And we're looking forward to people's comments. I am going to take a moment to introduce uh, Madeline Dean, our newest member to the Finance Committee, and actually probably the newest member to the House Representative. Madeline, if you want to wave or say hello. She comes out of Montgomery County. And then I'm going to start to my far left with Representative Fabrizio, if you just want to say who you are and where you represent. Well, Fabrizio, Erie <coughs> County. Mario Scavello, Monroe County. Margo Davidson, Delaware County. Phyllis Mundy, Luzerne County. Uh, Curry Benninghoff Center, Mifflin County, and my Executive Director, Tammy Fox. My Kathy Executive Director, Chuck Quinnen. Kathy Rapp, Warren Forest, and McKean Counties. Jim Cox, Berks County. Kevin Boyle, Philadelphia. You got me. Your first time on tape, young lady. Oh, thank you. Madeline Dean, Montgomery County. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Fred Keller, Union and Snyder Counties. Eli Vankovich, parts of Westmoreland and Armstrong Counties. George Dunbar, Westmoreland County. Gordon Denlinger, Lancaster County. Scott Boyd, Lancaster County. Thank you. Uh, members probably will be coming and going. Uh, please don't be alarmed. There are conflicts, conflicting other issues going on, but uh, we will do our best. Uh, we are here to discuss House Bill 1776, a, another proposal in issue to the ever- challenging school property tax uh, and overall school funding matter, which has plagued the General Assembly for probably two or three decades. It's estimated that uh, Pennsylvania's 501 school districts generates about $13 billion a year in residential and commercial property taxes. Throw a little figures out there for us to put this figure in perspective. Both Pennsylvania sales tax and personal income tax generate about $10 billion each during the previous fiscal year. Uh, over the past 10 years, school property taxes outpaced increases in education funding. Total state funding in Pennsylvania schools has increased $3.65 billion, which is about 66% overall from 1998 to 2008-09. In comparison, school property taxes have increased $4.77 billion, which is a 77% increase during that same time period. So what's that mean? For every dollar in new state funding, local schools have increased property taxes $1.33. Thus, our challenge continues to not only be a revenue issue, but that issue of a spending uh, even with the increase in property tax revenue state funding, school districts continue to have to borrow and in some cases are borrowing at alarming rates. According to Pennsylvania Department of Education, Pennsylvania school districts owed about $19.4 billion in 2002 in debt. And the closest figure we have in 2010 shows that figure to be at about $26.6 billion, which is also a 38% increase. So the challenge of just coming up with a Quick formula to replace property taxes and or any school funding is not very simple. Uh, I'm not here to go on and on. We do have the author of the bill here. I encourage those who are testifying to give us your presentation as succinctly as possible because we'd like to also be able to ask some questions. And I will be hosting a secondary uh, hearing just because we couldn't get everybody here in a timely fashion today. Without further ado, I will... Uh, Ask Representative Cox to take the desk in front of us in the interim. Uh, Brian, yes. I want to introduce uh, Representative Brian Almont, and you're also out of Lancaster, correct? And then we will turn the microphone over to Chairwoman Monday for some introductory comments, and then Representative Cox, you can proceed after that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my my uh, experience with this issue began as a private citizen with the League of Women Voters back in 1988. Um, at that time, there had been a, a very comprehensive property tax reform proposal that passed the legislature and required a referendum, a statewide referendum. Um, it would have increased the PIT in order to reduce property taxes. 75% of Pennsylvania's voters voted to defeat the referendum. Back in 1998, we had another uh, bite at the apple. 
that Act 50 of 1998 offered school districts the opportunity to, via referendum to shift from property taxes toward an EIT, an earned income tax. Voters in four of the 501 school districts at that time approved it, and the rest rejected it. That was at the local level, a local referendum. And then in 2006, Act 1 offered school districts the opportunity via referendum to increase or implement their earned income tax or PIT, personal income tax, to reduce property taxes. Voters in only nine uh, of the 498 school districts that put it on the ballot approved it. Voters in all of my four school districts voted against it. So we have tried many times over the years to address this burdensome property tax issue. I think the enormous problem that we face is the diversity of Pennsylvania. We have urban, rural, and suburban school districts with different funding problems, um, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that during the course of the hearing. But I want to commend those. Seth Grove had a bill before us recently. Um, Representative Cox, I know, has worked along with Representative Sam Rohr in the past. And many, many others, Democrats and Republicans, have offered possible solutions um, to the property tax problem. Obviously, when the problem proved intractable, we went to gaming um, as a source of new revenue that would not require an increase in taxes except for the gaming industry. Um, and that has proven mildly successful in helping our most uh, at-risk seniors uh, through the property tax rent rebate program and has provided very modest relief on individual property tax bills. But today we look at another attempt to make the shift from property to income and sales taxes. I commend Representative Cox and all those who worked on this bill for their efforts um, and hope that we can find a reasonable uh, solution to this very intractable problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairwoman Wending. Uh, Representative Cox, this is the day you've been waiting for. And I, too, commend uh, Seth Grove and Dave uh, Mahoney and some other members who've tried to do some other things. And I think it's nice to have an option with multiple different plans on the table. So we look forward to your presentation. Representative Cox, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The idea behind House Bill 1776 is not a new one. Uh, as Chairman Mundy pointed out, this is a, an idea that Representative Sam Rohr advocated for uh, continually during his time here in the House. And it's something that the public has come to know uh, through various different names, whether it's a Commonwealth Caucus plan or what have you. Uh, there are various other versions of this uh, that have been talked about in the past. And so what I'd like to do is start off with kind of the overview of what this plan is, and then perhaps more importantly, what this plan is not, what it does not contain that prior versions uh, did contain. I know a lot of the members here uh, remember the older discussions. They remember House Bill 1275 from uh, both of the prior sessions. Uh, others don't know House Bill 1776 uh, at all. Uh, and, and I'm not sure uh, what our newest member, uh, what her background is on this particular issue, uh, but I'd certainly love to give her uh, an education on it today and, and any other questions she might have in the future. But um, By means of, uh, of giving, again, the, the broadest brush I, as I can to this, to, to boil it down to brass tacks, as they say, I'm going to be following the, uh, the summary that was, uh, that was provided here. Uh, it, it's a very thorough summary, and it, it allows me to move through it in a very, uh, a very organized fashion, and I think it makes sense. House Bill 1776 does have the goal of eliminating school property taxes, and it utilizes the personal income tax and the sales tax as the primary sources of its funding. The sales tax would increase from 6% to 7% on the existing goods and services that are currently taxed. The personal income tax would increase about 1% to 4.01 under the proposal, and 
that would uh, go from, again, 3.07 to 4.01. The sales tax would also see an expansion. And by an expansion, uh, I simply mean additional goods and services would be taxed under this approach that are not currently taxed. We also allow uh, local school districts to implement a local PIT and a local EIT on the local level. So we're not pulling away all levels of local funding. Some have thought that that was, a, uh, that was one of the approaches. We are not pulling away every single option for the local school districts to raise current funding. We're just removing the ability to raise school property taxes. Under the existing wording of House Bill 1776, and I've already had some people approach me about uh, some potential changes, uh, the property tax rent rebate program would be modified. Um, we changed the number slightly, uh, and then we, we uh, had originally planned to eliminate the program in 2013. We're looking at uh, leaving it in place because uh, even early on, I had, I had looked and said, okay, if we're going to eliminate property taxes, we're not going to need property tax rent rebate. Uh, my thinking behind that was the school property tax is the, the biggest tax that people face when it comes to property taxes. Uh, but some people pointed out to me that there are those who would end up paying school property taxes for the first time um, if we remove the program altogether. And so for some people, we would have an actual uh, substantial property tax increase. And that's not my goal, uh, because county and municipal taxes are also eligible under the property tax rent rebate. So uh, the language in this bill regarding property tax rent rebate uh, will probably change substantially uh, and may be removed altogether. But I wanted to point that out, that currently we make some changes to it. Um, and my goal was not to have anybody be hit harder with property taxes, and so it was an, an oversight on my part, and so I apologize for that. House Bill 1776 uh, also, as I mentioned, eliminates the school district's authority to impose school property taxes, and we do that beginning on June, uh, it actually begins on uh, July 1st. Uh, they, are no long, they would no longer be permitted to impose school property taxes. Uh, we would leave with them the authority to cover their debt service. Uh, statewide, debt service is an average of 10% of any given school district's budget. And with that 10%, we, we essentially leave the school district with roughly 10% of their property taxing authority, if that makes sense. And so it allows them to continue to pay their payments on their debt. Uh, one of the biggest problems that uh, we had with earlier versions of this bill were that uh, one of the biggest problems was that people said, you know, why are we taking on the debt of all the school districts around the entire Commonwealth? Why are we, uh, we're the responsible school districts over here. Why, did, why do we have to take on the debt of those school districts that didn't do things right? And so in trying to address that, we decided to leave that debt service with the local school districts, uh, allow them again to retain the ability to, to, uh, to impose property taxes, but only at the level to service their existing debt. The legislation calls for a, uh, a locking in of debt as of the legislation currently says December 31st, 2011. And uh, we essentially take a snapshot. Whatever debt they had at that point, that is the debt they can uh, collect property taxes to service. Uh, so it is a minimal level. The average around the state, as, as I mentioned, is 10%, which would mean there would be a 90% property tax reduction for the vast majority of Pennsylvania school districts. Uh, and those property taxes would only be imposed for the remainder of the life of the debt service. If they've got five years left, um, then they would have five years of property taxes at that significantly reduced level. If they happen to have entered into debt more recently, they would have to pay those that 10% or whatever percent it would be for the, retain, for the remainder of the lifespan of that particular debt. Another area that was uh, and before I go further, school districts, as it mentions in the summary here, school districts are not going to be allowed to incur any additional debt. I mentioned that. Um, but fund distribution, that was a big question. A lot of people came to me and said, I like the idea behind the bill. However, 
and their concern was funding as a whole is a, is a controversial subject in the House. Uh, when you talk about education funding, you talk to five members and they'll like the funding formula that we have for the basic education subsidy. You talk to another five and they can't stand it. Uh, some people love Hold Harmless, some people hate Hold Harmless. And so as I saw the problem that was going to be, uh, try, the, the huge problem that was going to be trying to be discussed in conjunction with this bill, uh, I and some others made a decision that would probably be best to pull the funding formula out. Uh, and so what we do, instead of saying that school district X will receive this amount and school district Y will receive this amount, we essentially take the existing school property tax level that they are, uh, that they're receiving uh, the way the legislation is drafted, the, the funding they're receiving through school property taxes for the 2012-2013 school year, that will be the snapshot year, if you will. And so the funding will be based on that. The amount of money that goes out to the school district will directly replace that particular amount. Uh, the goal was to essentially swap the funding, not create a new funding formula, not uh, go down a road that uh, would be fraught with all kinds of uh, subliminary uh, discussions and rabbit trails. The goal for this bill is to ask the members of the House and the Senate, do you want to change the source of funding from school property taxes to two broader based sources across the state, the sales tax and the income tax? I wanted to boil it down and have it to just be about changing that funding source. It's not about uh, do you like the way we distribute it. Uh, and that's why I tried as best as possible to just do an exact swap to make it as, as even as possible. Uh, by and large, members seem to be uh, excited about that in that it allows us to have the discussion outside of this bill. Uh, many times in the past, <coughs> versions of this bill got bogged down with discussions of the formula. And if they saw the spreadsheet and said, you know, they didn't get enough or their district happened to lose X, Y, or Z, um, that essentially was the death of the bill uh, as, as people began to look at it and pull it apart for their district. The discussions of uh, what's in the SUT, uh, what, what will be taxed that's not currently taxed, I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, I fear I'd probably put you to sleep uh, with the listing. I do want to point out two of the larger changes. We are taxing services, and um, you're going to see a lot of those on here today. By and large, our goal with taxing services was essentially to say, businesses, we don't want you to have, have to increase the cost of doing business. Uh, we know Pennsylvania is not particularly business friendly. And so we did not want to further burden businesses. So the goal was to say, uh, anytime a business has a transaction, we're going to try to pull those out and say, you don't have to pay sales tax on that. We're trying to treat those the same way that we have the manufacturing exemptions, the agriculture exemptions that are currently in place. Costs in Pennsylvania are not pyramided under the sales tax approach that we currently have in place. Uh, they're not pyramided for businesses in large part due to those two existing exemptions, agricultural and manufacturing exemptions. So we would treat uh, some of these services in a similar fashion. Uh, for instance, if a business utilizes a, an accountant, that would be a non-taxable event. Uh, if that same individual who perhaps owned the business, if he went and had his personal taxes done, that would be a taxable event. And so there is a distinction there because the individual will bear, the, the end consumer is the goal. The end consumer would be the one bearing the burden of the sales tax. I want to touch on two of the biggest changes to the goods side of things. Uh, people ask, you know, well, oh, you're not taxing food and clothing, are you? And uh, one of the things that uh, you learn early on is that food and clothing are two of the largest items that are not currently taxed in Pennsylvania. And in order to keep this from being regressive, uh, everyone has said, hey, the sales tax is regressive. The, the poorest people are going to be hit the hardest. Uh, they're not going to be able to, uh, to buy what they normally were able to. Their cost is going to go up. And so 
Uh, in response to that, I and some others came up with an approach that I think uh, will, will go in a long way to address that. Uh, on food, for instance, um, and I can provide any of you that, that would like a list, it's available online as well. The Pennsylvania WIC list is a listing of foods that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has worked with our public welfare department to come up with, uh, and it's simply a list of nutritious foods. Uh, there are certain parameters that are put in place by the USDA. It's for our participation in the federal women, infants, and children program. Uh, but what it does is it lays out core nutritious foods, uh, breads, cereals, milks, a eggs, cheeses, even has soy milk in there, 100% uh, fruit juice. Those are just a few of the items. And as I, as I mentioned, there's probably about a uh, nine or 10 page uh, booklet that that we can provide you that lists all of those things. But the idea was to say, if you want to feed your family with these healthy foods, we're not going to tax you. And so the legislation calls for an exemption of WIC foods. Um, grocery stores currently have this tagged in their system. They, they know what items are able to be purchased with the Women, Infants, and Children's program. And so the goal there was to say, uh, we don't want to incur additional headaches for those who would be administering this, uh, buying larger grocery stores. And so if you, they have an existing list already in their systems, uh, they know what's the permissible uh, as far as the Women, Infants, and Children program, we will just utilize that and they can just tag that as being non-taxable foods. Other foods, you know, if you want to buy the Lucky Charms that are all, uh, and I say Lucky Charms because that's one of my favorites, incidentally. Um, but when I buy my Lucky Charms, I'm going to be paying sales tax on it. But if I buy Cheerios, non-sweetened Cheerios, mind you, there's about 18 different versions of Cheerios these days. Uh, but if you buy the regular Cheerios, the whole grain uh, type foods, those will not be taxable. So I think we've gone a long way in that. And, and I wish I could say it was my idea, but um, the gentleman who's going to be testifying behind me had a lot of these ideas. And uh, we worked with taxpayer groups around the Commonwealth to come up with ideas that would help solve these types of problems and help address concerns that had been raised in previous versions of the, legisla of the legislation. As I mentioned, clothing is another pretty substantial amount of money that could be garnered if we were to tax all of clothing. But again, in an attempt not to tax the lowest income and not to hurt those who would be potentially hardest hit by a change to the sales tax, we looked at clothing and said, how can we avoid making this problematic for the lowest of incomes? And so we looked at the amounts of money. And we chose $50 as a starting point. Whether that changes throughout uh, the, the course of the legislative process, it will be up to you and others like you. But we chose a $50 amount. And that $50 amount, uh, the reason for that was we wanted to be, allow people to be able to purchase kind of the basics of clothing without having sales tax imposed on it. And there are not too many thrift stores uh, that have items where you can't clothe yourself for $50 per item. And so you could go and purchase a pair of pants, a shirt, socks, underwear, whatever was available at any given, whether it's a thrift store, whether it's a, a discount store, you can purchase all of those items. As long as each particular item was under $50, that would not be taxable. Uh, you could buy $1,000 in clothing but as long as each individual item did not surpass the $50 individual item point, there would not be tax on that particular, uh, on those transactions. And so those two distinctions in the food and clothing are different than I think any other versions that we've seen in the past uh, that looked at going down the road of taxing food or clothing. Um, whether it addresses the problem fully enough, we'll find out. Uh, but those, those two are key. And as I said, I'm not going to walk through all of the, the goods and services that are taxed. Um, I believe I've covered the vast majority of the, uh, the conceptual approach behind this bill. And at this time, I'd welcome any questions. Thank you, Representative Cox. I think that was a pretty good thorough overview. Uh, before we go to questions, I did want to note for the room, listeners in the room and those watching TV, we are also joined by many other members who would like uh, to be involved in this process and are not on the committee. 
Uh, they're in the room currently, Representative Bloom, Representative Saccone, Representative Gillian, Representative Topol, Representative Quigley, and Representative Tuitt. Truett, pardon me. And Representative Tina Davis. So thank you for joining us, and uh, we can provide written material for those members too, even though they don't serve on the committee. We want them to be as informed as possible. All right, questions. Chairwoman Monday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a ton of questions, but I'm only going to ask a couple and let other members of the committee thank you. follow up. Um, my understanding is that your, your claim is that you eliminate all school property taxes. But is that reliant on the referendum at the local level? Um, it is not reliant on the local referendum. The local referendum is a uh, – this bill would eliminate school property taxes across the board. It takes away the authority to levy any school property taxes except for the debt service that I mentioned in my, in my comments. Um, but all school property taxes would be eliminated. There, there's not a, a swap required well, on that but, local level. Well, let me ask it a different way then. Sure. Uh, the chairman referenced $13 billion statewide in property taxes that are currently levied. Does the increase in the in the PIT and the EIT, I'm sorry, the PIT and the sales tax at the state level, does that amount to $13 billion? The, it's about $13 billion. The total uh, school district local tax revenues, uh, according to the information I received from our appropriations, uh, totals $12,760,000,000. 12 and some change, uh, if you want to put it that way. So it's not quite $13 billion, but uh, the way we arrive at our numbers is this. Um, the $12.76 billion, that's a starting point uh, for what we would have to replace if we included local school district debt. But when we looked at the number, the amount of local school district debt that I referenced that we're leaving with the school districts, that amounts to $2.275 billion. And so it brings us down to closer to $10 billion that we need to, to raise with the sales tax, the income tax, uh, and then the expanded sales tax. Well, wait a minute. Um, you're confusing me. And, and my, my question, I think, is pretty simple. What is your revenue estimate for the PIT and the sales tax at the state level? How much do you believe will be generated by that, those two items alone at the state level. Okay, the the personal income tax increase going from 3.07 to 4.01 percent is expected to, ge to generate uh, th almost three and a half billion. Uh, it's 3.467 billion. Uh, the sales tax increase going from six to seven percent on the existing base with no changes made, just everything we're taxing now, is expected to generate about one and a half billion. Uh, but, but the bill includes the changes, so you can include the changes in that number. Well, I was just getting ready to give you the estimated expansion. Uh, the well, give me, give me the, total, the total that would go into the replacement of the $13 billion. You've got $3.5 billion from the PIT. How much from sales? Sales tax. Sales. Expanded sales is another $4.6 billion. All right. So you've got what, eight round figures, $8 billion. Where do you get the other? It's about, it's actually closer to nine. Okay, where do you get the other to make up to the $13 billion currently being levied in, in property tax? Well, as I mentioned, we're not, we're not taking up the entire $13 billion. We're only taking up uh, 10 well, point. Well, that, that leaves... <laughs> That leaves the school districts with billions of dollars in revenue that they've lost that they have no way to make up, right? No, because we're leaving... Unless, unless their voters pass a referendum, which no, they... Okay. No. What, what am I missing? Um, the the $2.275 billion that we take off the top, if you start with $12.75 billion, take 2.275 right off that, right off the bat, 
and that gets us down to just over $10 billion. That's the amount of money that we need to raise, that we need to fill, because we're leaving that 2.275, we're leaving that amount with the school district, and they have the school property taxes that they need to collect just that percentage. Well, now I'm even more confused because your, your claim is that you're eliminating school property taxes. Over time, it will be eliminated. Yes, ma'am. Some districts, and I believe there's, a, there's about 15 school districts, uh, I think it's 15 school districts that have zero debt service as of right now, according to... So, the, the so those 15 school districts would have zero property taxes upon full implementation of this plan. So the residual is for debt service? The residual is only for debt service, yes, ma'am. Okay. So... <laughs> All right, I don't know how to ask that to get, um, I'm going to have to think about your answer and, and see what I'm missing here. But um, let me just ask one other question. You are not taxing business to business services, but you're eliminating all property taxes for Walmart and Best Buy and um, industrial and commercial properties. Commercial properties would receive the same benefit. Uh, as you're probably well aware, we have uh, House Bill uh, 2300, I believe it was, uh, that just went over to the Senate. Um, the goal there would be to allow us constitutionally to address property tax elimination for only homesteads. Under the existing Constitution, though, we're not able to eliminate school property taxes uh, just for homesteads without doing it for uh, commercial properties as well. We can only go up to 50% of the median assessed value. And so we're uh, significantly limited. Do um, you have any indication that the Senate's going to take up 2300 or that they're going to consider it in conjunction with a bill that would eliminate property taxes? Uh, like any other bill, I'm taking this one step at a, at a time. I'm just thrilled that the chairman has allowed us to have a, a hearing on this and uh, allowed the bill to get some discussion going. So I, I can't speak as to what the Senate will do. That'd be a question for Senator Scarnati and the others. Well, <clears throat> the biggest problem that I have with your concept is that until 2300 passes, it's an enormous shift from the business community to individual taxpayers, especially low-income working families trying trying to raise children. Well, let me address what I think was perhaps a, uh, a question embedded within a question. Uh, businesses, uh, I think you're asking, you know, are businesses going to get off scot-free essentially? And, you know, we're making this huge, uh, lifting this burden off of the, the businesses and what are they contributing to the community? Um, the, the approach behind this was that by and large, about 70, 70 to 75 percent, we hear differing numbers from different groups, uh, but a significant percentage of businesses pay income tax, not at the corporate net income tax level, but at the personal income tax rate of 3.07. And so... Talking about sub-S corporations. Whether it's S corporations, sole proprietorships, uh, you've got significant employment going on around the state uh, that is simply taxed under the 3.07 rate, the personal income tax rate. And so in increasing their rates, again, 70, 75% of businesses pay tax at this level, we're going to be increasing their rates from 3.07 to 4.01. So they are going to be paying. Um, you know, is it something that every business pays in the same way? No. Um, but because of the... But how about <clears throat> the Walmarts and the Best Buys and the huge... Uh, multi-state, multinational corporations that have properties in Pennsylvania. Do you have any ballpark number as to what that uh, property tax revenue amounts to? We we don't have uh, we don't have the the breakdown as far as what Walmart pays versus you know the five and dime store that's locally owned. We don't we don't have a breakdown on that. We know uh, roughly uh, the numbers. I think we got. Uh, Trying to think, I think it was 65% of all properties in Pennsylvania are classified as residential. That does not necessarily mean they are homesteads. 
but when you're looking at the overall business taxes, about 35% of property taxes are paid by some sort of commercial uh, entity. And as far as saying, you know, will, will Walmart end up paying no property taxes? They are, they are a, if they are a property owner, uh, they will not pay property taxes. That is correct. Uh, but again, that's 25 to 30 percent of the entire tax load uh, for our school property taxes. And again, we're looking at the, the, the statewide issue as well. Uh, the goal was to not hit the 70 to 75 percent of, of uh, businesses who employ uh, a, a huge number of individuals around the Commonwealth. We didn't want them to have to have to uh, pay a higher income tax and not receive any benefit for it. Uh, the other side of the coin there as well is that when a, especially the small businesses, and I can't speak to what the WalMarts and the Best Buys are going to do, uh, but when you have a smaller business, uh, you've got a business that's paying twenty five, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year in school property taxes, suddenly that money is freed up. I've already talked to a, a good number of, of business owners who've said, uh, I've asked them, what would you do with that? Oh, I'd hire more people. Well, that, that is one of the things I hear. Some of them said, hey, I, I definitely pocket some more money because I've been going behind. Uh, Pennsylvania is a tough business climate. Some say they would hire more. Some say they would expand the physical footprint of their business, uh, which ultimately leads to more sales and more income tax generated for the state. So, look, I, you know, I, I was in business myself for years and years. Uh, for ten years before I got here, I managed a small business. I absolutely understand how difficult it is. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at tax fairness because the individual is going to be paying more in uh, sales and income, and they're not going to get any more of a break than the individual who is owning a, a business and generating profit and able to expense a lot of that profit in, in salary, fleet lease cars, all kinds of other. We did it. We did it. I know all about how you do it. So I'm just looking for tax fairness. That's all. Well, the ultimate fairness. I thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. You're welcome. I thank you. I'm going to let somebody else ask a question. If I may, the the ultimate fairness um, behind this bill is the fairness to the individual taxpayer, uh, the individual who has paid off his home 15, 20 years ago and is now looking at going into a reverse mortgage, uh, the individual who loses his job and then is suddenly faced with losing his home uh, that he may already own. And so it's situations like that. It's that individual tax fairness. Uh, in my mind, nothing is more fair than, than letting people keep the very property that they own, whether they're an individual or a business. Uh, but certainly individuals uh, do, not, uh, do not come up on the short end of the stick with this. Uh, I'll remind the members we are having a second hearing June 4th, so Representative Cox will be uh, able to be questioned there as well. Uh, Representative Rapp has been gracious enough to give Representative Mary Escavello a quick moment and then Representative Rapp will follow him. Thank you, Representative, um, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to follow up. There was a, a couple of comments made on the history. We passed many, we tried to do many referendums, and they've all failed. And they failed because we haven't had tax fairness. Um, if you look at the hold harmless clause and what it's, what it's done to us over the years, you've got school districts uh, receiving uh, dollars based off of a 1990 census. So if you, in the growing areas of the Commonwealth, you've been shafted because you're still getting funded off of that 1990 census. If you've lost population, you're still getting funded off of that 1990 census. I've been, you know, we've been talking about this for a long, long time. So if you put it out there on a ballot, Philadelphia is not going to vote for it. They're getting funded at a 1990 census, and I believe they've lost four legislators since then. You know, the, the, the growth in those areas, the, 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 in the areas that the legislators went to, got the representation. However, the dollars associated with the growth stayed in Philadelphia. So if we really want tax fairness, we need to do something like this to address it for every taxpayer in the Commonwealth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Scavello. Representative Rapp, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, actually, uh, I have the same concerns as Representative Scavella, although I ha hold the uh, opposing view uh, regarding hold harmless. It's not just uh, Philadelphia, it's all of rural Pennsylvania as well. So <coughs> under your le legislation, Representative Cox, 
all of the tax revenue would uh, go to the state and then be distributed. Am I correct? That is correct. And my concern is when I uh, spoke with you earlier, you said you would give, uh, in your legislation, would give a one-year time frame mm -hmm. to uh, decide what that distribution level is. Is, is that correct? Oh, yes. Uh, according uh, the way we've drafted the legislation, and and I'll take this opportunity right here to say this bill is 170 pages long. I know there are drafting errors that are uh, my fault. I know there are drafting errors that are Legislative Reference Bureau's fault. They've already notified me of, of one of those uh, just recently. Um, so I don't put this forward as the end all uh, of, of legislation that's finely tuned and doesn't need any changes. Uh, but with that said, our goal in, in putting the legislation together uh, in regard to the question you asked, if we, upon full implementation of this, uh, school districts will receive the same dollar amount that they got under school property taxes. For instance, if your school district is collecting $100 million in school property taxes in the 12-13 school year, in the following year, that is the dollar amount they would receive. We do work in a, uh, a cost of living adjustment, if you will, if the economy allows for it. If the sales and PIT allow for it, we allow for that level of growth. If it doesn't, they, they're guaranteed that, that, uh, that minimum uh, that they would have gotten under the school property taxes. However, the next, uh, literally the next paragraph in the legislation says that the legislature is going to be responsible for coming up with a funding formula for all subsequent fiscal years. Right, and that, that is my concern, Representative. Um, you know, I represent two uh, school districts, well, actually I have three school districts, but two of my school districts, Warren County, the county is one school district, Forest County, the county is one school district. Um, we do not have the economic base that the fast-growing school districts enjoy. Uh, these are rural districts that are doing everything that they can do to consolidate, to downsize. We do not have Taj Mahal buildings or Taj Mahal sports programs. Um, some of our rural schools have, uh, you know, bare bones, uh, whatever we need to make sure kids get a good education. And quite frankly, I am a big believer in equal opportunity in education. And do I like the property tax? No. I'm, uh, I'm a property owner, and I have to pay that. And I, I know it's a burden. But I do have concerns um, about losing Hold Harmless because, quite frankly, rural school districts – cannot survive without that uh, hold harmless clause. Um, and our children in rural Pennsylvania deserve the same equal opportunity in education that that money provides, and they would not be able to survive without that hold harmless clause. And without having that distribution uh, connected to this piece of legislation and actually seeing you know, down the road, what those rural school districts would be receiving to uh, educate our children in rural Pennsylvania, that's, that's my, that's my uh, biggest concern with your legislation. Um, I was here in 2005, 2006, when Representative Rohr and we had the uh, Committee of the Whole on the floor and went over, you know, all the property tax uh, uh, pieces of legislation, but that that is my biggest concern as a rural legislator, uh, making sure that those dollars uh, go to those schools because our rural children uh, have the right to same equal opportunities in education as um, uh, folks that have a huge economic base in in their school districts. Thank you. These are the very comments that led me to poll. A specific funding formula out. We toyed with, uh, Representative Boyd and I toyed with some different formulas. He uh, did some background work for me and we looked at uh, ADM times equalized mills and uh, we looked at other variations on formulas. Uh, Mr. Baldinger and I looked at other ways to do things in trying to craft a formula that pleased all of the members. Again, we felt it was outside of the scope of this legislation and so we wanted to boil this legislation down and make it simply about do we want to find a more fair way to tax 
And we believe that shifting from a school property tax on the local level to a statewide funding source would be the more fair way to do it. And so uh, in, in deference to what you mentioned uh, in regard to hold harmless, I'm, I'm fully aware of that, but I, I would ask that uh, we take that up with uh, basic education funding formula discussions uh, and the, the discussions that would follow the passage of this bill that would enable us to put a funding formula in place to make sure your districts uh, and the children in those districts do not receive uh, any any less funding uh, than they need to provide a solid education. I would remind thank the members. You, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, and Representative Cox, could we actually stay specific to 1776? Uh, I mean, some of this information is important, and I don't disagree with it, but we're going to be really get crunched for time. And I also want to recognize Representative Delosier, Representative Briggs, and Representative. Thank you, Velakovich. I don't hate to <laughs> goof that up. Member. I know, but I always butcher it up. <laughs> Out of respect to him, don't want to say it wrong. Uh, next, we have Representative Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative Cox, for, for all your hard work on this. I just had a really quick, brief question. When you were referring to the residual uh, property tax that would be left to pay off debt, you also mentioned that uh, after implementation of the act that these schools can no longer incur any debt, what are they to do if they wanted to build a building or something like in, in that regards? I probably should have clarified, and that's an excellent question. Um, they're not able to incur any new debt uh, that they can collect based on the school property tax. Uh, the debt that is mentioned in, in this legislation is existing school district debt uh, that would be payable through a local school district property tax residual, if you will. Uh, any new debt that they wanted to enter into would have to be placed on the ballot. And so this legislation is designed with the taxpayer in mind. It puts a question directly to them. Do you want a personal income tax or a earned income tax on the local level for local debt? Uh, and they can put that in place for a period of years. They can put it in place uh, for as long as the taxpayers allow for it. But it is something that has to go on the ballot first. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Denlinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Cox, just two brief questions, if I may. I think in the midst of your dialogue with uh, Chairman Mundy, um, you were taking us to equalization of sources versus the outflow. Um, I think we were at roughly $9.6 in sources based on the numbers you gave us. Um, are we still at a, about a $500 million gap that you were going to explain to us and didn't, didn't get there? Is that... There's, uh, there's additional money. The uh, existing revenues that come to us through slots, uh, that currently goes to the property tax relief fund. We would have uh, significantly less need for the property tax relief fund under this, relieving the property tax uh, rent rebate in place, due in large part to address this concern. But $828 million was the estimate provided to me as far as uh, the funding source there. Um, we would also we also uh, are attempting to see if we can pull in seventy million or so from the expanded gaming table games. Uh, those are some estimates that uh, it would be new revenues to the school property tax arena. But we we believe we might have the votes. Uh, an amendment passed uh, just this past spring, I think that that would have taken uh, money and directed it to property tax relief. So I'm I'm fairly comfortable in saying we could probably accomplish that uh, that same goal with with this. And then one other brief question. Uh, in, your, in the notes that we all received in the packages, um, there's an indication that mortgages issued by financial institutions, I believe, are exempt. However, um, are privately issued mortgages, citizen-to-citizen -citizen mortgages, taxed under the plan? The goal, um, I believe the wording tracks this exactly. But the goal behind this legislation, and as I mentioned, 170-page uh, bill, there are going to be errors that, uh, that I made uh, in drafting uh, oversights on my part as well. Uh, it is not my intent to tax those monthly mortgage payments, regardless of the source of the, uh, of the loan. So if, if you know, a father's son enter into some sort of mortgage arrangement, as you might see on some of the uh, you know, farm properties or whatever, a lot of times you see that it's not my goal to make home ownership or property ownership more difficult. So uh, that is something that would definitely need to be addressed in an amendment. And uh, I've expressed openness to, to modifications. This 
this bill is a starting point. It's an opening of a discussion, and I welcome all comments and concerns. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Dangling. Your next Representative Vankovich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Cox. Uh, two brief questions. Um, if you can just talk real briefly about the mechanics of how the sales tax uh, is, how it's the sales or the income tax are specifically reallocated back to the school districts. Um, and I'll give two analogies or two examples. I have many school districts in my district. Um, I have school districts that provide 70% of their funding with local property taxes, and I have school districts, school districts that provide 20% of their funding from local property taxes. Uh, obviously, the areas that are wealthier have higher income bases. They're going to be paying more under this proposal because they buy more, they make more. Uh, same, the opposite would be true for the other school districts. Can you help me understand how uh, how your plan provides equity for both of those environments? I don't think any piece of legislation is going to be completely fair. Um, my goal in this was to make the funding form or the the funding approach for schools more fair. Um, as I touched on earlier, in my mind, there's nothing less fair than asking an individual to leave their home uh, because they can't make that monthly mortgage payment, if you will, to their school district. They've made all the mortgage payments on a piece of paper. It says they own the home. Um, and so my goal is to, to take and make it more fair. Uh, am I saying that no one will end up paying more? I, I can't say that. Uh, but in utilizing the two broader statewide sources uh, of the personal income tax and the sales tax, um, I, I believe most people will find themselves in a uh, winning situation. If I can just make, I think maybe we were talking about two different subjects. Um, in, in many ways, uh, in revenue to the school districts coming from a local level provides a higher level of accountability. Uh, in other words, the school boards are being elected by people who are providing the revenue to run the school district. Uh, in the example where 70% comes from the local property taxes, uh, those school boards face somewhat tougher scrutiny um, because of the... and. and, and and the opposite side to that is that those school districts are able to have a higher level of discretion uh, if they want to if they want to build out their school in different ways if they want to uh, if they want to you know spend that money uh, in, in whatever way they see they see fit uh, the local taxpayers make the decisions and uh, so it works it cuts both ways so my question is um, you know thinking out of from that perspective and we're both in agreement that that renting your home from the government isn't a right isn't the right solution and that you know that that property ownership is not an indication of wealth or income or the ability to pay so we both are in agreement with that but my concern is is looking out for both of those types of school districts uh, and we can talk offline my 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 second question is regards to uh, subchapter G um, section 781.2 transfer to the public transportation reserve fund can you just talk real briefly about there must there must be something I'm missing uh, as to why uh, this is in the bill and if you could just shed, shed some light on that I'd appreciate it sure uh, that is a question that that uh, quite a few people are beginning to ask and it raises a red flag of, you know, why are we doing this? The goal behind this portion of the bill, the sales tax, uh, because we are not just doing what we do with the personal income tax and increasing a rate, uh, that's one of the reasons the bill is 170 pages long. We had to pull in essentially the entire sales tax code, Article 2 of the Tax Reform Code. And in doing so, uh, we did not want to change uh, the existing responsibilities that the sales tax currently had. And one of those responsibilities was to the P public transportation fund. So that percentage that you see pulled out, that's just a carryover from the existing uh, Article 2 sales tax. Um, it's not something that we create out of thin air. It was just to, to, to take and mirror as best we could uh, the existing law. And then we took the existing law and then overlaid expansion into that. Thank you. Thank you both for your brief explanations. Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, appreciate all the effort you have put into this. Uh, you've been at this for months, and many people in here have been at this for years, and I've been at it about 30 minutes. So if you don't mind, I'll ask you a couple informational questions just as I begin to gather some information about it. To follow up on what uh, Chairwoman Mundy asked you about, and you did that calculation also for the other representative, 
if I'm understanding it correctly, the shortfall in that calculation of both the personal income tax, sales tax, and the expansion of the sales tax is somewhere about a billion, under a billion dollars, which would be made up by gaming revenues? Is um, that what you're saying? I need to clear, it, not necessarily gaming revenues, okay. slots revenues. Gaming uh, funding is considered to be table games. Yes. Uh, okay. But yes, there's about $828 million, uh, that is that we are expected to receive in slots revenues uh, as we go forward. And is there a mechanism that this would capture that? Yes, this, this reaches out and grabs that, uh, and the goal behind the legislation would be to make sure that that revenue finds its way to property tax elimination okay. under this bill. And the numbers that you, your estimates are based on, what date are they? For example, when are you estimating the income tax, and when are you estimating the sales tax? When was that? These uh, these estimates, I believe, uh, they were current through February. Uh, we used as current information as we had. We went through and plugged in the governor's budget numbers, the estimates that he, uh, the Department of Revenue, uh, and the other agencies put together. We pulled those numbers in to try to make it as current as possible. Uh, the sales tax increase from six to seven being about one and a half billion dollars. That's pretty been pretty static over the years as I've worked with this. Uh, the PIT. Uh, bringing in close to three and a half billion, that has edged its way up uh, as incomes increase. That has that has gone up uh, fairly steadily. It's not huge jumps, but that's gone up. Um, and the expanded uh, sales tax base is also uh, based on those 2012-13 starting estimates that the governor's office used in his budget presentation. And and be, excuse me, because I do not know what does this. How does this anticipate a downturn? in the economy, um, as incomes fall, as purchase of goods falls. How does this uh, account for that? Well, overall, uh, income and sales are among two of the most stable uh, of, the, of the taxes. I can't say that they are the most stable, but they have a pretty significant level of stability simply because the cost of goods continues to increase over time, uh, as, as, as well uh, income levels continue to increase over time. And so while an in, one individual may lose his job, um, another individual might receive a pay increase to make up for doing the extra work that that individual would have been doing. And so it's not an immediate balance, but if you look at uh, the forecast uh, over the next several years, there's always an increase to the uh, income tax expected. Uh, even if it's marginal, there's always a, an increase. and. One of the reasons that we utilized uh, the sales and income taxes is because they are direct reflectors of the economy. Uh, when the economy is not doing as well, the revenues are going to, to flatten out a little bit. And so one of the things that school districts have not shown themselves good at doing is growing within the rate of inflation. The, uh, Chairman Benninghoff pointed out early on that school districts uh, have grown uh, for every dollar we give them, they increase property taxes a dollar thirty-three, uh, and so it's 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 one of those things that um, you know if you have a, a a kid that you've given a blank checkbook to and they misuse it, uh, you got to consider at some point taking it away. And so currently, the school district property taxes uh, in in many school districts is functioning in the same way that a blank check would checkbook would be functioning, and uh, this just pulls back that authority and, and significantly limits it and says, you're going to be able to see some growth, but it'll directly track the uh, sales and income tax, and when the economy allows it, you'll get an increase to that. I don't know if I agree with your characterization of the school districts from blank checks. Well, it's, uh, again, and it's not all school districts, but the significant number. Uh, I've got 70 co-sponsors, so we've got at least 70 members who have said, hey, Please, let's stay to the bills, we're, not, uh, we're not satisfied with what's happening. And my final question is Internet sales. What do you anticipate will happen as a result of sales of goods over the Internet? I don't have uh, estimates on that. We, we know that the Department of Revenue, uh, from testimony before this committee, is looking at efforts to, uh, to capture those sales. And I think uh, the more we see in the Internet sales arena, the, the longer we go, I think Congress is going to have to do something uh, that lays things out. I know that's one of the hurdles that we faced uh, in this state is, you know, can we tax those interstate inter, uh, commerce transactions and things like that? So uh, it's... It's something that remains to be seen, but uh, I, I'm confident that we'll be able to figure out a way to capture that revenue as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Uh, thank you both. Uh, we have also been joined by Representative Grove, Representative Harris, Representative Kavula Litch, and Kala Jerome. And for our last uh, question here, I believe, for Representative Cox is Representative Davidson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my, my questions uh, have to do with uh, collection and distribution. Um, and thank you for putting forward the bill. Um, property taxes in, in my area soar to the tune of nine to $12,000 um, a household. Uh, so there is definitely relie relief needed. But my concern is the funding of public education um, and the collection of the tax and the distribution of the tax. Uh, school districts are already um, facing um, cash flow issues in terms of payments to charter schools, when the state pays them, when they have to make disbursements. So uh, can you describe for me um, how um, the, the revenues will be collected, um, hopefully not going into what's described as a black hole of the, of the general fund? Um, is there going to be a set aside uh, or are you considering set aside a fund just for education funding and uh, at some point being able to put additional revenues in there if we see that there's a shortfall in terms of collection? And two, in terms of distribution, um, how will uh, funds be distributed from this fund to school districts in a timely way um, since they no longer have access to this other revenue? Well, the, uh, let me answer uh, your second question first. The Funding distribution, if you will, uh, it only it's for one a period of one year uh, after the full elimination of the school property tax uh, option for the local school district. Um, there will be quarterly disbursements, and we're not creating any new administration, uh, not creating any new bureau or anything like that. Uh, so it is designed for quarterly disbursements. Uh, quarterly is uh, the common thread between the corporate. Uh, payment of taxes, businesses paying their uh, their taxes, uh, PIT collections, all that. Quarterly was the the common thread there, and it's uh, it's proven useful in other disbursements for education funding. So we'll probably stick to that. The legislation does call for quarterly disbursements. Um, in regard to your first question, there is an education stabilization fund. Uh, that is a separate fund. This does not flow into the general fund uh, by design. This sets aside the amount brought in. Uh, under these changes, and it's designed to set aside the funding brought in, the additional income tax, the additional sales tax, and the additional uh, expansion of the sales tax, as well as pulling in the slots revenue. All of that will be directed into uh, the Education Stabilization Fund, which is a separate fund outside of the general fund, and that's where the disbursements will come from. And in terms of um, the state revenue that currently goes to school districts out of the general fund. Um, would that money flow through the Education Stabilization Fund, or would that be um, dispersed from the general fund in addition to um, this new fund? The basic education funding would continue to flow separately out of the general fund. So the, uh, the discussion of the basic education subsidy uh, formula that would take place outside of, outside of this uh, as it does right now. Um, if we choose to adopt a basic education funding formula that reaches out and says the Education Stabilization Fund will utilize uh, the same distribution methodology as the general fund does, then that's a decision for the legislature to make. But this bill does not call for a, a specific funding formula. It, it's a dollar for dollar replacement for the school property taxes uh, in, in, the, in that early year and then a funding formula would be put in place by the legislature uh, going beyond that. We don't, and we don't mess around with any of the existing funding formula in the general fund. It's outside of the scope of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cox. Thank you for your testimony, for your work on this bill. We know this is important to you and a lot of your supporters. If you want to join us back on the dais, we will get our next uh, testifier. That is uh, David Baldinger, spokesperson for the Pennsylvania Coalition.